about what's professionally known as Dunbar's number and what was termed online um, as the monkey sphere, which is an interesting idea about how many friends you can actually have. Because according to this number, Dunbar's number, um, there is a limit. The average coming out to about 150 per humans. And I thought I'd start out by being a little more specific because I'm sure you all have lots of friends, especially with social media today. Like, oh yeah, I've got 700 friends. Um, or friends, but um, Dunbar's number gets a little more specific. It's the num termed as the number of people one knows and keeps in social contact with. And things it does not include are the number of people known personally that you don't know any longer. Like you don't keep up at some point personal contact. Um, and it has to be a persistent social relationship. And because if you had like a relationship and then it stopped working, that would be based more on like your long-term memory than your actual ability to make and keep friends. Um, and what Dunbar did is um, just recently he was looking into monkeys and their relationships in their own personal little societies. Now, obviously, they don't have the same kind of connections and relationships that we do as humans, primarily because they don't have the same amount of development in language. Um, but what they do have is they have a variety of statistics. They've been highly studied on ideas such as grooming. And grooming for monkeys is one very important personal way for monkeys to get to know each other. And what they found is that um, they looked at a lot of different statistics. They looked at things such as um, the env their environment, their demographics, the anatomy, all these different things for different monkeys. And apparently there are surprisingly high number of statistics on monkeys. Um, and then looked at how many of these monkeys knew other monkeys in the sense that how many of them were grooming each other. And they actually found that they could put together a model. And it's kind of like a model that um, it, Dunbar, when explaining it himself, said that it's kind of, a kind of like a model that they use when they're trying to model the national economy. They have lots of different little factors or little variables that go into this equation that they use regression to create from all these statistics that they have on monkeys. And they actually found that it was very consistent in determining how many friends these monkeys would have. Now, that was really interesting, but they wanted to know what, overall, if there was one specific factor that led to why these monkeys could only have so many friends. Um, they found that for monkeys it was about 50. And one popular hypothesis had been that it related to how big these monkeys' brains were. Um, specifically a certain part of the brain called the neocortex, which is termed the thinking part of the brain. Um, they found that that's the size of the neocortex of the monkey's brains directly related to how many friends these monkeys have, or how many grooming partners these monkeys have. Well, after realizing that there was an incredible correlation with this with monkeys, they said, why not try it out with humans? And they did this, they looked at the anatomy of different humans' brains and found that on average, the human can have a social relationship with 148 people. And the range was, and that was a little, um, it was a little contested at first, but they found that when you look at the range between 100 to 230 people, and you put like a bigger range on it, they found like 95% accuracy with their model and how that work with the brain size. Um, and they found this kind of interesting. And it's been applied in lots of different areas. They had the, um, the story that Dunbar always likes to use himself is one about this company called Vortex that makes wetsuits, hiking boots, and ponchos. And when he started up his company, he started out like in his backyard, just like a small startup with like five people. Um, and then it kept growing bigger and bigger and bigger. And he found that once, the, and he was able to like buy off the space and build a factory, but he found that once a factory met more than 150 people, he saw efficiency actually decrease because people were no longer accountable to the other people that they were working with. And this was really interesting because it kind of validated what Dunbar was saying um, from monkey level and was trying to extrapolate on the human level. Um, so that's the story that Dunbar always gives, and actually this company Gore-Tex now 
only builds factories that accommodate up to 150 people. And they have factories that are like, like the factory is next to another factory is next to another factory. And one might think that, wow, that's really, really inefficient. But actually, Gore-Tex has found that for them, that leads to the highest amount of efficiency that their company can operate at because everyone's being held accountable to each other and everyone knows like everything from who's making the part that then comes to them to who's making the sanders that they eat at lunch. So um, this idea of the monkey sphere came up when Dunbar's number was being discussed and evaluated online um, from crack.com. The editor turned the uh, word monkey sphere to describe this idea of how many friends or people you can actually connect with on a social level. Um, but the interesting, I mean, and that's all very interesting, I thought, but the real interesting thing that I thought um, could be used with this monkey sphere and what other people have thought of as well is how this, what this says about society today. Um, there's a variety of different topics that the monkey sphere can be introduced to. If we look at economics, there's the, uh, there's the uh, classic question of communism versus capitalism. And we've seen communism fail time and time again, even though, in theory, it seems like a really good idea. And what this monkey sphere idea might suggest is that, um, sure, on a very small level, it would work. Um, so we have communes and different ideas of where it's just a small town where communism might work, and communism leads to equality and fairness and all the great things we learned about in US history. But when it tried, when it tried to apply on a larger scale, like Russia or the USSR at the time, um, it's not going to work out as well as they had thought. And that's because, as the monkey sphere would suggest, people aren't being held accountable to each other because they don't know each other. And that's the other part of the monkey sphere that's kind of interesting, is not only can you only have, on average, 150 friends, these 150 friends are the people that you're willing to, like you could ask, will you do a favor for me? And they'll say yes. But that means that if there are more people out there, outside of your 150 people, where you would ask for a favor and they would say no, a lot of times you, uh, they found that people will view these um, others, these 99.9999% that aren't in their 150 very negatively because they aren't the ones that will help you out. They don't really mean anything to you. And in the process, um, that's called into question a lot of things in areas such as journalism where if it's reported that, sure, 100 soldiers died in Afghanistan or something, um, that might mean something on a very shallow level, but whether or not people actually react to that intimately and care about these lives that have been lost, um, that's been seriously called into question. Um, we've also seen it when people, um, when politicians create campaigns, they try and find one person that you can relate to on a very deeper level. Example, Joe the Plumber. Um, it's just one of many examples where politicians will try and find one person that you can get to know more intimately, that you can rally behind and understand and relate to instead of throwing out statistics. I think that's part of why this 47% that Romney's faced, like obviously what he said wasn't good, but at the same time, people aren't sympathetic for, these, for all these other people that go out. I think that's a classic example of it. Um, so, when we look at this monkey sphere, we can see it in a lot of different arenas. Another classic example um, that's been, that has been applied to a lot is whether democracy is seriously effective. Because if you've got these people representing you, and all of a sudden they know you, and I'm sure they're trying to work for you, at the same time they're probably working more for themselves than the 150 people that they know, um, they're working for their monkey sphere before they are actually willing to put themselves to work for these thousands of people that they're actually representing. Um, and so this is what Dunbar originally started with, with his idea. Um, he's actually started a new study recently that I believe is still ongoing because I wasn't able to find the specific statistics for it, but he did a few interviews as it was ongoing. Um, that looks into how social media is affecting um, is affecting his number because if you know more people through Facebook, if you're friending them, are they really are they are you able to adapt and grow so that you can meet more people so that you can know more people and have more friends? And he said that through his preliminary study that he released, the answer is no, which would be interesting just because if you have 1,500 Facebook friends, that's great, but his studies would still suggest that they're really not your friends. So, um, I think that's, any questions or comments? I'd love comments.
say it's impossible to get rid of it, but personally I feel like accountability needs to be a lot heavier than it currently is, um, in the sense that people need to realize that who are like up for election and whatnot, that they need to be held accountable so that they aren't becoming corrupt. But I feel like it's a bigger issue. somebody in Oregon is not trying to totally undermine everything that I want to do in civil society is because they're connected to someone that I'm connected to that I'm connected to somebody else. I don't know really interesting. I wonder how, I wonder if he's going to study like how interlocking, you know, like circles and how that, that respect correlates with stability. No, that's definitely an interesting question. I mean, in part, he hope, I mean, accountability because if you're willing to do a favor for someone in your 150 and their favor is help out a guy in my 150, then all of a sudden you've got this ever exploding. When, when does it reach a critical mass and it all collapses? Yeah. You can only do a favor for so many. Yeah. Very cool. And how many yeah. people we got in brown? <laughs> we can make a monkey spear here. Brown monkey spear. So I don't really have 600 friends then? Sadly, no. I think you're more like Say in high school. 
school or something, we've developed our circle and established a circle of like 150 or whatever our limit is because, I mean, everybody's kind of trying to maintain as many friendships as they can in high school. Then, at this transitionary phase when we kind of come into college, do you think that as we are making friends in college, we are immediately kind of wiping away friends before? Or do you think during these transitionary phases, like the numbers is like for a short amount of time grown and then it kind of shrinks back again over time?
take someone in and drop someone, like, this is my patient, so I'm completely invested in you. But now you're better, so now I kind of have to get rid of you because I have more patients. Because they're seeing people every yeah. day. So. I think probably they, I'm sure there are some that they could eventually know well enough, especially if it was a chronic illness, that would probably, that might hopefully get added into their monkey spear. But at the same time, if you look at the kind of closeness that they would have with a, uh, with a patient versus a relationship that they would have with their spouse or their children, they're never going to be able to get as close with as many people as they would want to. Yes. This idea of what friendship constitutes, is it possible that when we watch like television or see celebrities or learn about people's lives, fiction characters, what have you, that things, people that aren't real in our lives become a part of our monkeys here because we're so intimately familiar with them. I definitely think that if Dunbar relaxed some of the limitations that he originally puts on his model, it would expand rapidly. But he did specify when he was starting out the study that they've done lots of tests on facial recognition. And on average, a person can facially recognize about 1,500 people, which is obviously a lot, a lot more, 10 times more. Um, ten times more than the people that they know intimately. So, like, I recognize Barack Obama, but I don't know him. So, I think if you were able to relax some of the limitations that he does put on his model, um, you find it increase exponentially. Yeah. I don't know. If, I don't know this might turn into a question, but it <laughs> seems that less. It's less of like here's a set amount of people. That actually are in your life. But it's kind of like a working memory, but more like working emotions that you have for different contexts. So, like, for the factory, obviously, those people in the factory have 150 people outside of that, but it's kind of that, it's, it's an indicator of your ability to work with people in each context. Like, I don't, anyway, I'm thinking while well, trying to figure this out while well, talking. It's really cool.